Hi, and welcome to Tea and Strumpets, a Regency Romance Review. I'm Zoe. And I'm Kelsey. And we're back with a book review. Yay! It's been a while. Uh, Lots of things have changed. (laughs) Yes, I'm going to quickly apologize if my audio sounds really wonky. I'm currently on a floor in an empty room with a chair and a yoga mat because (laughs) I'm moving and we moved all our furniture, but we were having trouble getting the internet set up. So it's on its way, but luckily we had some overlap with our old place and it's not that far away. So I'm currently using the internet at the old house in my empty (laughs) room with my yoga mat to try to dampen the (laughs) echoiness. Well, I think that uh, everyone will understand and appreciate the effort that you're making. (laughs) So yeah, I did not realize you had to drive to another place this morning. So I really do also appreciate you doing that so that we can get this done during Sarah nap. So hopefully she'll sleep the whole time because I'm more focused also. But I was so excited to talk to you today because we had also a short window to record because today I am getting my COVID vaccine. Yay! That's very exciting. Only because tomorrow I'm getting my second COVID vaccine. Ah! (laughs) I mean, like, I really did not think that we would be saying that this no. month. Like, I didn't think we'd be saying that until like the end of summer, maybe. Oh, yeah. No, for sure. So I'm just really excited. And uh, a few of more of my family members have been eligible to get it as well. So soon they're actually going to be able to meet and hold Serafina. And I'm just, I'm really excited about that. Also extremely nervous, but also really excited. <laughs> No, I'm real I am really excited. And so things are looking up and just thinking about vaccines, kind of similar stuff with our history fact. Um, so mm-hmm. I am excited to get into that. But first, a little note about the book we're talking about today. So the book that we are talking about today is Devil in Winter by Lisa Klepus. Oh. And this book is much beloved. And so is this whole series. And I felt like all of the other romance podcasts kind of had covered the heck out of this. Like I think um, uh, Heaving Bosoms and The Wicked Wallflowers both really, really, really love St. Vincent at Cheers. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so I felt like, you know, if people wanted to hear about this book, they've got places to go. But we had a listener reach out to us and she said, why don't you do this book? And then I was like, why don't we do this book? I love this book. I want to read this book. So let's just do this book. Absolutely. I was so excited to read it. I read it in a night. I'm just going to throw yeah. that out there. I read it in I, – I started it at 10 because this is my favorite time to start a book because I'm like, I'll just read a couple chapters. And then at like 2.30 in the morning, I closed it and was like, oh, such a good book. <laughs> so good. So happy. So – Yeah, I would love to get into our history fact this week. And our history fact is about germ theory. Mm. So this book takes place in 1843. And within this book, uh, our main character is caring for someone with consumption, which today we call tuberculosis. And uh, Sebastian, her husband, says that she needs to wear a kerchief over her face because there's a new theory about little tiny micro things that go through the air and get into your lungs that make you sick. And she's like, are you kidding me? I'm not wearing a kerchief over my face. And I also thought that was very timely. (laughs) I did. I loved it. And also because he was like, you have to keep the window open. And she's like, Uh no, it's cold outside. (laughs) Yes. So he shows her a pamphlet called A New Theory of Consumption. And so it was italicized and bolded. And I thought, is that something that's real from history? And it turns out it is. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about A New Theory of Consumption. And believe it or not, again, our book takes place in 1843, and A New Theory of Consumption was written in 1720. Oh, man. People really did not like the idea of germs. No, they didn't. (laughs) 
So Benjamin Martin, an English physician and author of A New Theory of Consumption, hypothesized that tuberculosis resulted from the actions of, quote, wonderfully minute living creatures. Once these creatures established themselves in the body, Martin thought they would generate the characteristic symptoms of consumption. He further theorized that close contact with a consumptive, including frequent conversation so close as to, quote, draw in part of the breath he emits from the lungs, was enough to transmit the disease. The germ theory of disease is the currently accepted scientific theory for many diseases. It states that microorganisms known as pathogens or germs can lead to disease. These small organisms, too small to see without magnification, invade humans, other animals, and other living hosts. Their growth and reproduction within the host can cause disease. So basic forms of germ theory were proposed also in the late Middle Ages by physicians including Ibn Sina in 1025, Ibn Katima and Ibn al-Khatib in the 14th century, Girolamo Francastoro in 1546, and is expanded upon by Marcus von Pleintz in 1762. However, such views were held in disdain in Europe, where Galen's miasma theory remained dominant among scientists and doctors. By the early 19th century, smallpox vaccination was commonplace in Europe. The doctors were unaware of how it worked or how to extend the principle to other diseases. Similar treatments had been prevalent in India from just before AD 1000. A transitional period began in the late 1850s with the work of Louis Pasteur. This work was later extended by Robert Koch in the late 1880s. By the end of that decade, the miasma theory was struggling to compete with the germ theory of disease. Viruses were initially discovered in the 1890s. Eventually, a golden era of bacteriology ensued, during which the germ theory quickly led to the identification of the actual organisms that cause many diseases. So, (laughs) again, pretty relevant to what we're living in right now with COVID, um, but also really amazing. Um, I thought that was really cool that Lisa Kleypas added that into the book um, and also that we were reading it right now. (laughs) Yeah, I loved that. I loved that scene where he's like, hey, I just read this pamphlet. You need need to stop seeing your father. She's like, "Uh, no. (laughs) And then he's like, okay, but then do this instead. She's like, "Uh, that's stupid. And he's like, just humor me, please. (laughs) Yeah. So I do want to give a quick trigger warning today. There is some physical abuse in this book. Um, So just a trigger warning for those that may need it. So today, our main tropes are marriage of convenience, the rake and the virgin, and can't fall in love. No, we can't. We can't let our heart be lost. And our main characters are Miss Evangeline Jenner and Viscount Sebastian St. Vincent. So I just want to say I did the summary for this and oof, was it a, a labor, shall I say, because this is such an amazing book. And if you haven't read this book, I really want you to stop listening to this podcast <laughs> and go read it unless you just really need to hear the synopsis first. Because first of all, number one, the synopsis probably won't do it justice if you haven't read it. Number two, this book is so uh, so driven by the conversation. So I tried mm-hmm. to include as many quotes as possible because I don't think that you really get a sense of the characters unless you hear them actually exchanging with each other. If I didn't include a lot of that, it kind of would have just been like, well, they have a marriage of convenience, they get to know each other, and then they finally fall in love. (laughs) Yes. And there's some drama that ensues. Like, yeah, that helps them get to know each other. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, that does not make a fun synopsis. So anyhow, uh, I really hope that the synopsis does Lisa Kleypas's mastery justice, but We'll see. So, all righty. Shall we get into it? We shall. Our story begins very shortly after the events of the last book in the series, and those events are important to mention here. Sebastian St. Vincent, reprobate, rake, and former best friend of Marcus, Marques Westcliff, had attempted to kidnap heiress Lillian Bowman, who was also affianced to said Marques. Desperate for funds, Sebastian had simply done the kind of thing that was most expected of him, but Lillian proved to be a most unwilling and spiritful victim. 
And that combined with Marcus's love for her made his plan unsuccessful. So Sebastian found himself back home in London, nursing a black and blue face, wallowing in the aftermath of realizing he'd done something quite stupid and lost his best and really only friend. And although he would have never thought it would happen this way, his fate is about to turn thanks to one Miss Evangeline Jenner, who has turned up at his doorstep in the dead of night requesting an audience. The novelty of a stammering, shy wallflower who is best friends with Lillian, demanding to see him at such an hour, is enough to pique his interest, and from there, it does not diminish. Evie Jenner has no other options and nowhere she can hide. Her deceased mother's family had abused her for long enough, and now they were about to marry her off to her nasty cousin Eustace to get her inheritance. Eustace has made it clear that he holds her in disgust and will not give her any freedoms or happiness once they are wed. In fact, she believes that her family will kill her once they are wed. And once that realization sank in, Evie ran. She knew she could not run to her father, Ivo Jenner, the proprietor of Jenner's Gaming Club, because he was ailing and would not be able to protect her from her uncles. Plus, he always sent her back there in the past, insisting they were better for her. She knew she could not run to her friends because they could not protect her enough either, and she didn't want to put them in jeopardy. No, she had to run somewhere they would never expect, and she had to protect herself with the one thing they couldn't get to her with. Marriage. So she sets off to Lord St. Vincent's home, luckily snagging a passing hack right outside her house, and seated in his parlor, she bravely offered herself and her inheritance in marriage to him. They set the terms. She will sleep with him only once to make the marriage legal, and he can continue his rakish ways. Quote, Lovely, he murmured. I rarely like to bet a woman more than once, a crashing bore after the novelty is gone. Besides, I would never be so bourgeois as to lust after my own wife." He also doesn't mind if she gets with child later by someone else. She gets some of the inheritance set in trust, and they must away to Gretna Green now, because her relations are likely already looking for her. Quote, I'd be a fool to trust you, he said. You could back out of our agreement at any moment, and you'd be an even greater one to trust me, because once we're married, I could play far greater hell with you than your mother's family ever dreamed of doing. I would... "'Rather have it be from someone I choose,' she returned grimly. "'Better you than Eustace.' "'Sebastian grinned at that. "'That doesn't say much for Eustace.' Sebastian is more than intrigued with Evie. He had met her once or twice, but never conversed with her. She was a shy wallflower, one known and ridiculed for stammering, with the fiery hair of her father and a timid countenance. But once he took a look at her, he realized she was quite beautiful, and that beauty was hidden by her reputation." But they agreed, and he sets about readying to leave for Gretna Green. Quote, she was amazed that she had managed to communicate so well with St. Vincent, who was more than a little intimidating with his golden beauty and wintry ice-blue eyes, and a mouth made for kisses and lies. It is from the start of their relationship, though, that Evie learns what Marcus had known all along, that much of St. Vincent was actually a facade. In truth, he was much softer than he appeared and had an extremely sarcastic countenance to try to cover that up. Quote, take my arm, he repeated in a pleasant voice that was underlaid with iron. I won't let you break your neck before we even reach the carriage. Available heiresses are difficult to come by. I'd have a devil of a time replacing you. And so a harrowing journey begins and maintains a breakneck pace until Gretna Green a few days later. Sebastian turns out to be an interesting and devoted companion, talking with Evie and helping her stay warm with heated bricks for her feet that he rewarms at every horse change. Her stammer disappears during the journey, and they both quickly realize that they quite like the other. Quote, my love, have you considered the possibility that you might enjoy our consummation sufficiently to want it more than once? How easily endearment seemed to trip from his tongue. No, Evie said firmly. I won't. Mm. A sound almost like a cat's purr left his throat. I like a challenge. Sebastian oscillates between adoring devotion for Evie to cold standoffishness once he realizes the thrall she seems to have over him. Once they reach the frigid Gretna Green, they head to the blacksmith who nickels and dimes them into a ceremony and gold band for Evie, with Sebastian finally exclaiming, It's not a love match, it's a marriage of convenience, and there's not enough warmth between us to light a birthday candle. Get on with it, if you please. Neither of us has had proper sleep in two days. 
but Sebastian warms up sufficiently by the next morning so that they can have encounter number one, which is an explosive realization for Sebastian, who is very experienced, but feels like this coupling was unlike any other he had had, and he immediately wants more. Evie also has had a fabulous time, but for her, that's that. She doesn't want to get attached to Sebastian because she knows he is a rake. She has had a hard life so far and knows she must guard her heart so that she can have her own form of a happily ever after. Evie wishes to journey back to London at the same pace they left it, but Sebastian heavy-handedly insists that they will stop for at least one night. Evie is furious because she wants to return to see her, her ailing father as quickly as she can, quote, now it's began the exercise of husbandly authority and the obligation of the wife to obey him. It was clear that Evie longed to argue, but instead she stared at him with a frown notched between her eyes. Softening his voice, he murmured, You're in for a difficult time of it, Evie. Having me for a husband will be trial enough, but caring for a consumptive during the last stage of his illness, you'll need all your strength. No use depleting it before you even get there. Evie stared at him with a renewed intensity that made him uncomfortable. What eyes she had, as if someone had collected layers of blue glass and shone the brightest sunlight through it. Are you concerned about my welfare? She asked. He made his voice mocking, his gaze cool. Of course, pet. It's in my best interest to keep you alive and healthy until I can collect your dowry. <laughs> On the carriage ride back, the two enjoy bantering quite a bit, though Evie is obviously exhausted and worried about her father. She learns that Sebastian's father is a decent and kind man who has whittled away all the finances of the dukedom through jolly excess, which is why Sebastian was in the financial straits that he is. Plus, the fellow had the indecency to be extremely healthy, so it would be a good long time until he and Evie were the Duke and Duchess. In fact, they, quote, probably wouldn't inherit until they were both too decrepit to enjoy it. However, Sebastian was good with numbers and investments and had plans to build his finances on his own. But Evie asked, quote, have you ever considered going into a profession? He gave her a blank look. What for? To earn money? Lord, no, child. Work would be an inconvenient distraction from my personal life, and I'm seldom disposed to rise before noon. My father is not going to like you. If my ambition in life were to earn other people's liking, I would be most distressed to hear that. Fortunately, it's not. However, their travels have given them a crass a crash course in each other, and both are realizing that their interest in their new spouse is piqued. And, quote, as she drowsed in his arms, it occurred to her that he provided the illusion of something she had never had before, sanctuary. His hand passed repeatedly over her hair in the gentlest of caresses, and she heard him murmur in his dark angel voice, rest, my love, I'm watching over you. While the journey helps them grow closer, it also helps them see their differences and clashes. Sebastian wants Evie again the night they stop at a coaching inn. She reiterates that she doesn't want to continue marital relations because, quote, I have no objection if you choose to have paramours. It's just that I don't want to be one of them. The sexual act means nothing to you, but it does mean something to me. I have no desire to be hurt by you, and I think that it would be inevitable if I agreed to keep sleeping with you. Their conversation flames into a fabulous sparring match until they get to the crux. Quote, you can't be faithful to one woman. You've proven that. Just because I've never tried doesn't mean that I can't, you judgmental bitch. It simply means I, that I haven't wanted to. The word bitch caused Evie to stiffen. I wish you wouldn't use such foul language. It seemed appropriate, given the proliferation of dog analogies, Sebastian snapped, which, by the way, is an inaccurate characterization in my case, because women beg me for it, not the other way around. Then you should go to one of them. Oh, I will, he said savagely. When we return to London, I'm going to embark on a spree of orgiastic debauchery that won't end until someone is arrested for it. But in the meanwhile, do you truly expect that the two of us are going to share a bed tonight and tomorrow night as chastely as a pair of nuns on holiday? And so they do not have any relations on the journey, and their relationship becomes tense and strained. When they arrive at Jenner's club, Evie is almost turned away by one of the employees, Joss Bullard, who answers the back door, but Sebastian's aristocratic manness helps them enter without issue, only eyebrows raised when he announces Evie as his wife. 
Her father is quite far gone. It won't be more than a few days, but Evie attends to his every need and completely forgetting her own until Sebastian comes in heavy-handedly again, insisting that she rest and eat with him. Then he even insists that she wear a handkerchief around her nose and mouth, as one doctor has been touting the notion that consumption is caused by tiny creatures that are transported through the air. Evie scoffs, but Sebastian insists. However, it's almost a moot point, as her father passes hours later. Evie, in her grief and exhaustion, recuperates for a few days. When she emerges from her fog, she is surprised to learn that Sebastian has not returned to his home, nor has he been idle. He's planned her father's funeral, and he's followed through on their earlier conversations and made a lot of changes to the club. After taking a look at the books, he had realized that some of the employees had been skimming off the top, and he quickly dispatched them. Evie's father had also made some bad investments and gambles, and his fortune wasn't what it once was. Plus, Jenner's was in a shabby state and needed a renovation. So surprising everyone, Sebastian had taken the reins, shut down Jenner's, and began the transformation. Perhaps, though, Evie shouldn't have been so surprised, for when they had first arrived to care for her father, they had quite an interesting conversation. Quote, I'm perfectly safe here, she countered with annoyance. I am still acquainted with many of the employees, and I know my way around the club better than you do. Not for long, Sebastian muttered, and his gaze returned almost compulsively to the main floor. I'm going to go over every inch of this place. I'm going to know all its secrets. Taken aback by the statement, Evie gave him a perplexed glance. She realized that the subtle changes had taken place in him from the moment they had entered the club. She was at a loss to account for his strange reaction. His customary languid manner had been replaced by a new alertness, as if he were absorbing the restless energy of the club's atmosphere. "'You're staring at the club as if you've never seen it,' she murmured. Sebastian ran his hand along the balcony, railing experimentally regarding the smudge of dust on his palm, and brushed it off. His expression was contemplative rather than critical, as he replied, "'It looks different now that it's mine.'" She had been skeptical of his actual devotion, stating at the onset, quote, "'There is no one to replace the manager you fired.'" "'Yes, there is. Until a suitable manager can be found, I'll run the club.'" The quail egg seemed to stick in her throat, and Evie choked a little. Hastily, she reached for her wine, washed it down, and regarded him with bulging eyes. How could he say something so preposterous? You can't. I can hardly do worse than Egan. He hasn't managed a damn thing in months. Before long, this place will be falling down around our ears. You said you hated work. So I did. But I feel I should try it at least once, just to be certain." As work continues on at the club and Evie tries to get back on her feet, she and Sebastian have more ups and downs. During an animated conversation, he waves his hand for emphasis and Evie cowers, making him realize she's been beaten before. Sebastian is wrecked in this moment and vows to keep her safe from her uncles. But their relationship yo-yos with moments that bring them close and then their sexual tension tearing them apart. They like each other's company too much to stay completely apart. During this period, Joss Bullard finds Evie one day to tell her that a Mrs. Hunt is at the back door to see her. Evie rushes down there, aghast at the thought of her dear friend waiting out in the dirty alley, but finds out that she's been tricked. Joss has led her into the hands of her uncles, who throw her into a carriage which contains her cousin Eustace. They rough her around a bit and let her know they've got a priest who will deem her marriage unfit and she will be married to Eustace this very day. Luckily, Sebastian returns from the errand he was on just in time and furiously engages with her uncles, ultimately besting them and rescuing a shaken Evie. After the fight, Sebastian and Evie are both worked up, Evie jealous thinking that Sebastian had been with another woman at a brothel when her uncles first had arrived, and shaken from the event, and Sebastian is riled up with pent-up sexual tension and fighting energy. One may... (laughs) One may think that this would lead us to our second encounter, and yet our hero and heroine manage to keep things only to a kiss for now. Sebastian essentially tries to change Evie's mind with illicit, passionate talk, but Evie remains steadfast. So we get to the crux finally when Sebastian says, quote, I want you more than I've ever wanted anything on this earth. Sebastian took a shivering breath. Tell me what I have to do to get you. Tell me what it will take for you to let me into your bed. At first, insisting that there's nothing he could do, Sebastian pleads again, quote, Evie, I can't hold to our agreement. I can't live with you, see you every day, and not have you. I can't. You'll have to think of a way to solve this, Evie. Think of something fast, because otherwise... 
Evie wants monogamy from Sebastian, but she doesn't believe that he'll be able to hold to that promise based on his past. So while he agrees at first when she admits that that is what she wants, she insists that his word alone isn't good enough. Quote, I don't believe you. Good God, Evie, do you know how many women have tried to obtain such a promise from me? And now, the first time I'm willing to take a stab at fidelity, you throw it back in my face. I admit that I've had a prolific history with women. That's not the point. A frown creased her forehead. I don't blame you for your past, or at least I'm not trying to punish you for it. Ignoring his skeptical snort, she continued, but it doesn't make you an especially good candidate for fidelity, does it? His tone was surly as he replied, What do you want of me? An apology for being a man? A vow of celibacy until you've decided I'm worthy of your favors? Struck by the question, Evie stared at him. Women had always come far too easily to Sebastian. If she made him wait, would he lose interest? Or was it possible that they might come to know each other, understand each other in an entirely new way? She longed to find out if he could come to value her in ways beyond the physical. She wanted the chance to be something more than a mere bed partner to him. Sebastian, she asked carefully, have you ever made a sacrifice for a woman? And so, with some back and forth, Sebastian vows to be celibate for three months, and if he can do that successfully, Evie will go willingly to his bed after that for as long as they both shall live. Sebastian has seen an opening in their argument, though. Quote, You didn't say that I couldn't kiss you, he said, his eyes bright with devil fire. I'm going to kiss you as long and as often as I like, and you're not going to utter a word of protest. That's the concession you'll give in return for my celibacy. Damn you. As renovations continue, Evie's friend and a trusted Jenner's employee, Cam Rohan, spots Joss Bullard and follows him to ask him some questions and follow up on Ivor Jenner's bequest to Joss. Joss has a primal hatred of Evie and seems also to be beset upon by some kind of madness. Cam, usually quite steady, is shaken by Joss's vitriol and reports this to both Sebastian and Evie. Although it may seem like much time has passed, in reality, it's only been a few weeks since the beginning of the book. Evie is still very much grieving her father's death, so Sebastian allows her to stay at the club for now, though he finds her presence distracting, especially as he gets crankier from his celibacy vow. However, they manage to have some lovely moments where they grow closer together in between. Evie feels idle, and Sebastian gives her jobs to do for the renovation, including directing the workers occasionally, and she starts to find her voice and inner strength. They have one of the most sensual kissing scenes where Sebastian lets Evie know that these three months won't be easy for her either. Quote, as high as the fire in me burns, Evie, I shall stoke it in you. Sebastian, she strained a little and he pinned her more firmly against the table. It's my right to kiss you, he reminded her, wherever I want for as long as I want. That was our bargain. Before things can get steamier, though, they are interrupted. But never fear, dear listeners, for Encounter 2 isn't far behind. After some very flirty billiards and some delightful banter, including, quote, Did you ever chase after the housemaids when you were a boy? Good God, of course not. How could you ask such a thing? Sebastian looked indignant. Just as she felt a twinge of guilt and began to apologize, he said smugly, They chased after me. And also, another tender moment, quote, Ah, well, I suppose there's some value in that. God help me if I should ever lose my looks. I wouldn't mind. He gave her a quizzical smile. What? If... Evie paused, suddenly embarrassed. If anything happened to your looks, if you became less handsome, your, your appearance wouldn't matter to me. I would still... She paused and finished hesitantly. Want you as my husband. Sebastian's smile faded slowly. He gave her a long, intense stare, her wrist still clasped in his hand. Something strange crossed his expression, an undefinable emotion wrought of heat and vulnerability. When he answered, his voice was strained from the effort to sound cavalier. Without a doubt, you're the first one who's ever said that to me. I hope you won't be such a pea goose as to endow me with characteristics I don't have. No, you're in doubt enough as it is, Evie replied, before the double meaning of the statement occurred to her. <laughs> that was a good one. After that intimate moment, they finally get intimate, with Sebastian following through on his words from before and kissing her below her skirts. Quote, you said I could kiss you, came his gentle, wicked whisper near her ear, but my love, you didn't specify where. 
Finally, it's time for Jenner's to reopen, and Sebastian is full of nervous energy. His interest in running the club has not waned, and he's found a new purpose, though he hasn't quite come to grips with that in his heart yet. However, he had insisted that Evie be at his townhouse by now, and she had done everything to remain. Sebastian wanted her somewhere safe so he didn't need to worry about her. Another wrinkle appears while they're arguing about her leaving. Westcliff has arrived. The last time he and Sebastian had spoken had been their fight after Sebastian had abducted his fiancée, and Evie had yet to speak with Lillian about her marriage to her kidnapper either. Marcus has visited at Lillian's behest, though, to confirm that Evie is okay and to offer her sanctuary with them if she needs it. He inquires if she were married under duress, and she vehemently replies, No, Evie said earnestly, inching closer to Sebastian's side as if she were trying to shield him. Truly, my lord, it was my idea. I went to Lord St. Vincent's home to ask for his help, and he gave it. I do not regret my decision. I would do it again without hesitation. Lord St. Vincent has been nothing but kind to me. She's lying, of course, Sebastian said with a callous laugh. I've been a bastard to her, he told Westcliff flatly. Fortunately for me, Lady St. Vincent was ill-used by her family for so long that she has no concept of what it is to be treated well. That's not true, Evie said to Westcliff. This has been a difficult time, as you can imagine. I could not have survived it without my husband's support. He has looked after my health and sheltered me as much as possible. He has worked very hard to preserve my father's business. He defended me when my uncles tried to compel me to leave with them against my will. You've gone too far, sweet, Sebastian told her with baleful satisfaction. Westcliff knows me well enough to be certain I would never work, or defend anyone for that matter. I only bother with my own interests. However, Evie and Westcliff seem to be paying no attention to Sebastian or his remarks, which riles him up enough for an outburst when Evie mentions that Westcliff loves Lillian, quote, He doesn't love her, Sebastian snarled, pushing Evie away from him. Suddenly, it felt as if the room were shrinking, the walls drawing closer until they threatened to close him in a fatal vice. He doesn't believe in love any more than I do. How many times have you told me that love is a delusion of men who wish to make the necessity of marriage more palatable? I was wrong, Westcliff said. Why are you so irate? I'm not. Sebastian broke off as he realized that he was unraveling. He glanced at Evie and felt the startling reverse of their positions. She, the stammering wallflower, now serene and steady, and he, always so cool and self-possessed, now reduced to an impassioned idiot, and all in front of Westcliff, who observed the pair with keen scrutiny. I love that line. Why are you so irate? <laughs> so great. Flustered and out of place, Sebastian flounders to insult them both. Evie stoically removes herself from the room, but Westcliff stays. Quote, This isn't what I expected to find, Westcliff said quietly. You're not yourself, Sebastian. Go to hell, Sebastian mutters. No doubt that was what you came to tell me tonight. If so, you're about a month too late. That was my int intention, Westcliff admitted. Now, however, I've decided to stay and have a snifter of brandy while you tell me what in God's name you're doing. To start with, you could explain why you've taken it upon yourself to manage a gaming club. Westcliff's apparent forgiveness deflates Sebastian, who relents to join him for a drink, but first must see that Evie is not unescorted through the busy club. He spots her moving through the very crowded floor, and something pings inside him with urgency, and he breaks into a run when he notices that Cam has spotted something on the balcony. He turns to look himself, only to see Joss Bullard with a gun trained on Evie's back. Quote, Driven by raw instinct, Sebastian leaped forward with lightning speed while hideous fear burned through him. Evie's form became so sharp and detailed in his panicked vision that even the velvet nap of her gown was distinct. Every nerve and muscle strained to reach her, every thundering beat of his heart laboring to feed blood to his fast-moving limbs. Seizing her with frantic hands, Sebastian turned his own body to shield her and used the momentum of his speed to bring them to the floor. The shot brings the club to a halt and then to a frenzy. Westcliff arrives to a shaken Evie and a shot Sebastian who begs Westcliff to keep her safe. What follows is a tumultuous recovery and terrible fever and infection. Barely hanging on to life, Sebastian begs Evie not to let the doctor bleed him. And then Evie, Cam, and Westcliff pack his womb with every remedy they've heard of to help it heal. Sebastian is a bear while fevered, and a bear again when it finally breaks. He continues to be a bear as he convalesces, hating to require help from anyone. But Evie remains frustratingly calm in all this, refusing to rise to his baiting. Finally, she says... 
Do you want to know what I think, Sebastian? It took every particle of his will to keep his voice controlled. Not particularly. I think that if I leave this room, you're going to ring the bell again. But no matter how many times you ring or how often I come running, you'll never bring yourself to tell me what you really want. Sebastian slitted his eyes open. A mistake. Her face was very close, her mouth only inches from his. At the moment, all I want is some peace, he grumbled. So if you don't mind, I also think, she said unevenly, that you're going to lose our bet. Recalled to sanity by a flash of indignation, Sebastian scowled. Do you think I'm in any condition to pursue other women? Unless you intend to bring someone to my bed, I'm hardly going to. You're not going to lose the bet by sleeping with another woman, Evie said. There was a glitter of devilry in her eyes as she reached up to the neckline of her gown and deliberately began to unfasten the row of buttons. Her hands trembled just a little. You're going to lose it with me. And they do have encounter number three after Sebastian does his best to protest, but Evie says she didn't promise not to cheat. So Sebastian's recovery speeds up soon after their coupling, and he finds his way to the club floor. Their relationship is strong, but not clear as they haven't said all the words they need to say yet. But soon they do, when one evening Sebastian comes to their room and tells her he wants to make love to her, quote, as I have never done with anyone before. He continues with, Evie, during the past few days, I've had nothing to do but lie on this bed and think about things that I've spent my entire life trying to avoid. I told you once that I wasn't meant for a wife and family, that I wouldn't have any interest in a child if you... He hesitated for a long moment. But the the truth is, I want you to have my baby. I didn't know how much until I thought that I would never have the opportunity. I thought... He broke off, a self-mocking smile touching his lips. Damn it. I don't know how to be a husband or a father, but since your standards in both areas seem to be relatively low, I may have half a chance at pleasing you. And while this feels very happily ever after, our villain is still at large. Cam chased his trail for a while and found that he had died of syphilis and was buried in a mass grave. But one evening, as Evie is preparing for bed alone, Joss appears in her room. His skin is sloughing off from syphilis, and he is fully controlled by the madness. He admits that he knew a secret passage into the club that no one knew, and that he hated Evie because he was in truth her half-brother, and Jenner should have been his. Luckily, Sebastian comes to the rescue just in time and distracts Bullard so that Cam can take him down. Cam is shaken but knows he did the right thing, and after Sebastian speaks with him, he returns to comfort Evie but bungles it as usual. Sebastian has decided to send Evie to the country because he wants her safe. Evie is not happy with this plan. Quote, I'm not going to argue with you, Sebastian said gruffly. You'll go where I want you to go, and that's that. The old Evie would have been cowed and hurt and would probably have obeyed without further argument. The new Evie, however, was much stronger, not to mention desperately in love. I don't think I can stay away from you, she said in a level tone, especially when I don't understand it. There was a crack in Sebastian's composure now, a wash of color that crept up his collar. He raked both hands through his hair, further disheveling the glittering locks. Lately, I've become so damn distracted that I can't make a decision about anything. I can't think clearly. I have knots in my stomach and constant pains in my chest. And whenever I see you talking to any man or smiling at anyone, I go insane with jealousy. I can't live this way. I... He broke off and stared at her incredulously. Damn it, Evie. What is there for you to smile about? Nothing, she said, hastily tucking the sudden bile, the sudden smile back into the corners of her mouth. It just, it sounds as if you're trying to say you love me. Sebastian, of course, flails wildly and trying to explain it differently until, damn you, he said desperately, I've got to send you away. You're not trying to protect me. You're trying to protect yourself. She hugged herself to him tightly. But you can force yourself to take the risk of loving someone, can't you? No, he whispered. Yes, you must. Evie closed her eyes and pressed her face against his. Because I love you, Sebastian, and I need you to love me back, and not and not in ha- half measures. And he finally relents. Half measures. My God, I love you so much I'm drowning in it. I can't defend against it. I don't know who I am anymore. All I know is that if I give into it entirely, he tried to control the anarchy of his, bre- of his breath. You mean too much to me, he said raggedly. And the two of them profess their love more and more for each other, and the future looks bright. They finally run out of words and head off to bed. 
And then we have the epilogue. The wallflowers are relaxing together, and Annabelle is very pregnant. Lillian is newly pregnant. And now they have all turned their attention to the last wallflower to find love, Daisy, and are excited to help her. Evie is blissfully happy and in love with Sebastian. Her rake has reformed, quote, just enough for her. Oh my god. Oh my god. I'm not gonna lie. Just rereading those quotes on the love at the end totally like made me teary eyed. I just was like, oh. I know. Each time that we read the quotes, like you could see the other person's face like starting to smile. Because it's just like there's just something really magical about this book. And uh, I don't really know how we're going to articulately discuss it, but uh shall we take a break first and adjourn to the parlor? We shall. So today we want to talk to you about Love at First by Kate Claiborne. Mm-hmm. Love at First is a new contemporary romance that's been listed as one of Goodreads' hottest romances of 2021. It's full of bickering neighbors, surprise reunions, and the mysterious power of love. So, the synopsis reads that 16 years ago, a teenaged Will Sterling saw, or rather heard, the girl of his dreams. Standing beneath an apartment building balcony, he shared a perfect moment with a lovely, warm-voiced stranger. It's a memory that's never faded, though he's put so much of his past behind him. Now, an unexpected inheritance has brought Will back to that same address, where he plans to offload his new property and get back to his regular life life as an overworked doctor. Instead, he encounters a woman, two balconies above, who's uncannily familiar. No matter how surprised Nora Clark is by her reaction to handsome, curious Will, or the whispered pre-dawn conversations they share, she won't let his plans ruin her quirky, close-knit building. Bound by her loyalty to her adored grandmother, she sets out to foil his efforts with a little light sabotage, but beneath the surface of their feud is an undeniable connection. A balcony, a star-crossed couple, a fateful meeting, maybe it's the kind of story that can't work out in the end, or maybe it's the perfect second chance. Ugh. And also, Kirkus Reviews said that this is, quote, the comforting rewrite of Romeo and Juliet you didn't know you needed. And if you didn't get that from the synopsis, well, I'm sure you did. But, oh, so cute. So exciting. Yeah, that sounds super exciting. And you can get it already, which is even more exciting. No waiting required. <laughs> And if you would like to pick up Love at First, we have a handy link for you in our show notes so you can grab it right now because, again, it is already out. My favorite kind of read. <laughs> <laughs> I love the anticipation, but I also just love instant gratification. <laughs> oh, 100%. I'm the worst about it. I was like reading, I was trying to read something else, and then the new Kerrigan Burn, the Devil You Know book popped up, and I was like, switch. <laughs> Yes, uh, that one is like very much on my next uh, next to read pile. Anyhow, before we tangent too far, I do want to say if you are listening to us right now on YouTube, if you want to go ahead and click that like and maybe that subscribe, we would so appreciate that. And if you're not listening to us there, if you want to go ahead and subscribe to us on YouTube, we would so appreciate it because it is a great way to get updates from us and also interact with us uh, on our individual episodes if you would like. Uh, and you can find us all over the internet uh, in other places like Instagram and Twitter at T is in Tom and is in Nancy Strumpets and Facebook slash T and Strumpets. And if you really want to be in no, you can sign up for email notifications on our website. If you subscribe, you'll be the first to know what we're reading each month. Plus, you'll get all sorts of extras, including exclusive content from each of the authors who join us on the podcast. Our website is romancepod.com, and there you can find episodes, more information about us, and other resources. So take a look. All right, Kelsey, now comes the even harder part of talking about this book. Uh, I feel like such pressure to talk about it. And I should just let the pressure go and gush because that's really how I feel. Like this, 
I love this book. I love this book so much. I loved it from like the first chapter. It is again one of those books that has like you know it's it's a it's an incredible masterclass in first chapter writing. I feel Ugh. like it happened when Midnight by Julianne Long is also like that, mm-hmm. where like the first chapter is so incredible and sets the scene so perfectly, you yeah. can't put it down. No, and I mean I literally couldn't like I've read it before and I was like oh I've read it before like I know I like it I'll just read a couple of chapters and put it down and I couldn't I could not put it down because I could not find a good place to put it down because uh-uh. I just wanted to know more and I just wanted to keep reading Sebastian. I just wanted to keep reading Evie because their characters like through the whole thing, like just, I can't tell you just from the moment they set out for Gretna Green and Sebastian is just like the warmest, nicest human being, despite the fact that everything out of his mouth is the opposite. Mm-hmm. But he's like tucking her against him and Kelt can keep her warm. And he's like, don't worry, try to sleep, like rest against Actions me. speak louder than words. Oh my God, they do. And just from the moment they set off, I'm like, I love him so much. <laughs> so much. Okay. And I know that he kidnapped like her friend in the last book. I know. We're supposed to hate didn't, him. <laughs> I know. But he didn't. He didn't like do any, you know, he and and they have a conversation about this where like Evie's like, you wouldn't have raped her, would you? And he kind of goes like, well, I don't, I, I, no, I wouldn't. Yeah, no, he's (laughs) like, I'm big, bad and fierce. But like, no, I actually like wouldn't ever do that because that's not who I am. Yeah, he just there's so many great quotes that I that I included in there where it's like he, you know, Lisa Klippis does such a brilliant job of explaining how he tries to sound cavalier Mm -hmm. or he, you know, the walls are closing in around him and he lashes out and just Evie standing there so calmly at this point. Oh, it's just it's so brilliantly written. Even as we talk about, though, because, you know, we just skipped over it where, like, Westcliff comes in and, like, he's all ready to, like, save Evie from the evil Sebastian and, like, their friendship was destroyed. And then after literally watching five minutes of the two of them together, Westcliff's like, all right, what's going on here? I'm not even mad anymore. Tell me more. Like, I'm still your best friend, even though I kind of hate you for, like, kidnapping my wife. But at the same time, too, like... What's happening yeah. here? <laughs> and yeah. then he stays and takes care of him. And like Lillian comes in and she's like, I don't like him, but you obviously do, Evie. And so I'm going to help save him, despite the fact Ugh. that I can't stand him. Ugh, Lillian is so wonderful. And I didn't include her in the synopsis because, again, you can't include everything. We but, can't. There's... But when she comes, I know, when she comes in, it's so great. And she has so many great quotes, too. <sighs> In fact, I have one of her quotes as as one of my favorite quotes, so we'll get to that later. <laughs> uh, no, it just was like there was so many good things happening here. I just ah, uh, so good. Yeah, and again, this is one where it's just like it's so conversation heavy, and really, the timeline of this book is about six weeks maximum. Oh like, yeah, I like think, it's cause... really quick. Like, there's so much that happens just in like the week it takes them to get to and from Gretna Green. Kelsey, I think it only takes three days. I think it only takes two days for them to get there going no, day and night. That's true. But that's why I'm saying like I was giving it a – you're right. It's not even a week. It's literally it's like so five short. days. It's five yeah. days of I think them it's going two, two right and now, back. getting married and then getting back and then everything else starts. Every time I thought I was like getting towards – the end because I didn't remember all the things that well. I remembered the banter. I remembered Evie and Sebastian really well. I remembered Cam. I remembered the wallflowers, mm-hmm. but didn't remember this like crazy madman at the end. Like totally because forgot no about nose. that. Yeah, I know. no nose because the syphilis has literally taken it off. Oh god. Ugh. Ugh. Yeah, I thought about having syphilis as my history fact, but I decided to go. You know, we all know that syphilis is terrible and we all know there's different forms. And if you would like to know what exactly syphilis can do to you, there's a Johnny Depp movie called The Libertine. And at the end of it, he has syphilis and you see a very good characterization of what this man, Josh, probably Josh probably looked like because things are literally like falling off his face. Yeah, Ew. I watched that movie thinking it was going to be a fun romp. It was not. <laughs> it was not a okay. fun romp. 
Well uh, noted. So let's get into our deeper discussion about our hero and our heroine. We'll start, I think, with the easier one to discuss. I don't know. It's easier for me. So let's talk with Eve, about Evie. I, again, love Evie. She, you know, is this abused, traumatized woman who, you know, through her friends started to find her voice a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. With the wallflowers. She had a little bit of support, but she had never told any of them that her family was abusing her. Like she, she'd never told anybody. No, that they, they had an idea, but they never knew the true extent of it. Yeah. And so, you know, she finally finds herself in a desperate situation and realizes I have to go. And this idea that she has to find someone who's as desperate as her so that it can happen now. It's just, it's brilliant. It's oh, yeah. a brilliant plot device. Oh, no. But it's because just, she's like, well, amazing. if he was willing to kidnap Lillian for her fortune, I'm just going to offer him mine and it'll be great. <laughs> well, yeah. And then he can keep doing his ways and he can have a fortune and a wife he doesn't need to worry about. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's it's so great. And I, you know, I, I generally don't like the plot of keeping your, you know, I can't love anybody. And usually it's the other way around, right? That the man is like, I can't fall in love. Mm-hmm. I won't fall in love with you. Um, but it's it's kind of like Anthony Bridgerton, right? He's like, yeah. I'm not going to fall in love with my wife. Mm-hmm. And here we have Evie, the, the wife saying, I'm not going to fall in love with my husband. And I love that. I mean, Sebastian also doesn't believe in love. So like that's part of it too. Yeah. But like I do love that Evie's like, no, no, I'm just going to protect my heart and protect my future by not falling in love. Yeah. She's like, well, I can't – well, exactly. She's like, I can't afford to fall in love because I've married this man who's clearly a rake and – Therefore, I'm just going to have to distance myself enough so I don't fall in love with him so he can keep being him because that was the arrangement we made. And I can't expect to put expectations that won't get met on him. Yep. Now, I also love that she really has a full transformation. Like, you know, I talk a lot about the butterfly from the chrysalis. Mm -hmm. And I even feel like that quote I included before where, you know, Sebastian sees himself as this kind of stuttering, impassioned, what he thinks is a fool. Mm -hmm. And Evie is now calm and serene and like strong. Yeah. And he sees that, the reverse of their positions. And, you know, obviously he's, he is a little bit shaken by it, but as a reader, it's so rewarding. And it's also like, it's the, it's the kind of thing you need in a relationship, right? Mm -hmm. You need to have moments where you balance each other and one partner is stronger than the other to, to help when, when one partner is struggling. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, it's really, I think also what we talked about, like the transformation, but Evie never lost her true self. Like you would still see little stammers here and there, but she just was more, She was less concerned about if she stammered in that sense. And like, it happened less and less and it rarely happened with Sebastian. And so for him to hear her stammer, he was like, oh, something, yeah, something's up. But he also like, what was cool is like, you know, him giving her jobs to work with the workers allowed her to grow, but didn't, he didn't like take her hand and say, I'm going to, to help you get rid of your stammer. He said... I'm, he said, I believe that you can do this thing, yes. you know, and, and, uh, and by just having that faith in her, by giving her something he believed she could do, mm-hmm. she rose to the occasion. Mm-hmm. That is so cool. <laughs> like, yeah, it was so, so much better than a lot of the other like transformations we mm-hmm. see in, in these books. Yeah. I feel like we are hero and heroine discussion of kind of like meshed into one. Oh, they um, have. Because, but as we said, as you just were saying, like they're truly partners by the end of this book. And that was mm-hmm. something that was so great because they grew and they really started their partnership right from the get go. And so yeah. that partnership really was allowed to flourish. And so to the point where it is kind of hard to entangle, untangle one from the other because they're so intrinsic to the other. Yes, they are. And I mean, there's one thing that I left out with Sebastian, since we're bleeding over into Sebastian now, too, which was Evie at some point, they're talking about his family history. And it turns out that he had had, I think, three sisters. And, oh, God, um, he had you know, the his worst. Mother, oh, my God, it's terrible. 
yeah, two of his two or th- he maybe he had four sisters. I'm not, I don't remember, but they died of smallpox um, or scarlet fever, I mm-hmm. believe. And um, his mother also died. I don't remember. How, I think in childbirth, perhaps. I, I, I don't think no, his yeah. sister, a third sister lived to adulthood, but died in childbirth. Mm-hmm. And so the child died as well. So he had lost every woman in his life. So then all of a sudden, and it said so nonchalantly mm-hmm. when it's said, but Evie really understands why he feels like he can't love another woman because every woman he's ever loved in his life has died very tragically. Yes. Absolutely. And, you know, that was his trauma. And that is where you can kind of understand why he was so against the idea of love and not bringing himself to it. Although he wasn't quite, you know, the Anthony Bridgerton of it all. And like, he was more just like, I don't believe in the love, you know, because I can't afford to believe in love. Because that's how I'm going to protect myself from the trauma that I experienced. Yes. Well, yeah. I mean, and... uh, I just, I feel like literally we could talk about him all day, but um, we probably should just give them a rating. I mean, it's going to be a big surprise, but I give them both tens. I was going to say, can we just say they're both tens? (laughs) I mean, if there was a 20, they would be 20s. There's not a, like, there's not a hair out of place with either of these characters. They're so perfect. And the writing is just so flawless. No, because the thing is they... They have their flaws, they have their arcs, and everything about it just flows with one another. And again, like the partnership that develops between them is just beautiful to see unfold. Absolutely. So let's go on to our favorite quote. I had so many in here, and so many of them honestly are my favorite, but I have selected uh, two other quotes that I think are really good. So shall I kick us off? Yes, yeah, you can kick us off because I just have to search through. I have a few highlighted, but I have to search through. So one that I really liked is when Sebastian first meets Cam Rohan and has a little bit of like a a scowl about him. And Evie doesn't understand or Evie thinks that Sebastian is being racist because Cam Rohan is a gypsy or is a Romani. So she asks him if, you know, if that's the reason that Sebastian dislikes him. And Sebastian says... I rarely dislike people for things they can't change, Sebastian replied sardonically. They usually give me sufficient cause to dislike them for other reasons. Oh, that was a good one. Yeah. And then there's another one where Sebastian has decide to send, decided to send the uh, the the club's whores away because he doesn't want to have them at the club, but he has decided that he'll make an agreement with a brothel down the street. Mm -hmm. And uh, Evie says, I think you would still be a cockbot, Evie said, only by stealth. Morality is for the middle classes, sweet. The lower classes can't afford it, and the upper classes have entirely too much leisure time to fill. Such a good quote. Oh, that really is. Morality is is for the middle classes. Ugh. Uh, it's I, I really there's some really timely things in that like that line I was like oh my god what world we're living in like she looked at the world because it's so true yeah it's so true and, so true and finally I have one last one that's from Lillian when uh, she comes to help uh, nurse Sebastian back to health and Evie is freaking out that he's going to die mm-hmm. and Uh, It says, she reached out and hugged Evie once more and spoke into the wild tangles of her hair. He's not going to die, you know. It's only nice, saintly people who suffer untimely deaths. She gave a quiet laugh. Whereas selfish bastards like St. Vincent live to torment people for decades. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. So I have two. One of which is also when Lillian comes to help. And... I just thought, I don't know, I think I just personally identified with this quote. Um, Zoe, you've known me for a while. You might understand why. So the quote is, no, if it were a coma, he couldn't be roused. And he definitely stirred just now when you shouted. I didn't shout. I called out, Lillian corrected. There is a difference. (laughs) Is there? Westcliff asked mildly, pulling the covers down to Sebastian's hips. You raise your voice so often. I can't tell. Oh, I love it so much. I was so like, sweet. I was like, oh my god, the story of my life. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. <laughs> but it's also just like such a sweet, like real, relatable, obviously, yeah. window into their relationship. Absolutely. And 
Oh, and the last Lisa Claybus is a goddess. I know. And then the last <laughs> one is our profession of love scene. It's a little bit more of an mm. expansion on that. So you don't have to be anything other than what you are. Lifting her head, Evie stared at him through the radiant shimmer of her tears. Isn't that what you told me earlier? If you can love me without conditions, Sebastian, can't I love you the same way? I know who you are. I think we know each other better than we know ourselves. Don't you dare send me away, you c coward. Who else would love my freckles? Who else would care that my feet were cold? Who else would ravish me in the billiards room? Oh, I just got like goosebumps thinking I about know. it. Oh. Oh, I love it. Because it's also Evie standing her ground with him and just being like, and I love it. She's like, you coward. Yeah. My favorite quote from this book is the audio book of Devil in Winter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. There you go. Okay. So steaminess rating and our encounter counter. We had three encounters and one they went off to bed. I have to say this book is on fire. Like this book isn't like that explicit and everything, but like this book has one of the most passionate kissing scenes of mm -hmm. just kissing. And I just feel like this book is on fire because their chemistry is just so constant. Yeah, I do agree. I 100% agree. The steamiest rated was off the charts. Yeah. And that it's not, it's not like they were doing crazy sexual acts. It's just like they, the two of them are like a tinder and a the spark and they just like the or, I don't know like a, they just they're fire I don't know how else to explain it <laughs> yeah no they really well, are. I guess it's like fire and ice right you have the devil well you have the devil but he's got these icy wintry blue eyes and she uses so many great like similes and metaphors and there's all these devil references throughout the book like it's so good Ugh, oh my god so although we could talk about their steaminess again all day we're going to go on to our feminist recap. And I just, I already said it, but like supporter. Supporter. I mean, 100% Sebastian supporter. Sebastian just like, just, you know, is like, oh, Evie needs something to do. I shall give it to her. And, um, you know, you see her transformation from this kind of timid creature into someone who can hold her own and someone who has been abused and alone into someone who has support, um, but also can support herself, you know? And it's just, there's so much value in seeing that story. There's also value in seeing Sebastian's story, in seeing someone who is so sardonic and so, you know, cynical kind of come around and still have that personality, but to be understood, mm -hmm. right? Like to, to have him be understood as who he is and be the best version of himself. No, absolutely. He finds his value. Oh yeah, he does. He finds his value. And I think that there's just so much in all the characters of the book, at least, you know, the ones we like and the ones that are good, you know, this book really shows the uplifting, you know, like Westliff comes in hating St. Vincent, but then is like, interesting. How can I help you? Lillian is there mm -hmm. to support Evie, despite the fact that she does not like Evie's husband. But mm -hmm. Evie is her good friend. And same thing, there's this moment we haven't talked about where Annabelle and Daisy come to visit Evie before Lillian mm -hmm. gets back. And they're like, it'll be fine. Like, we love you. We're not going to like throw you out. Yeah. Learning what toxicity is and what, you know, support feels like. It's just, it's such a, and it's, it isn't like, it's not done through words. Like the, the transformation to me is not done that much through, through, through like, ex, like flat statements. It's done through actions. Again, like, like I said, this book is so much dialogue, but at the same time, there's just like, actions of things that are underlying and those actions every action like is so critical mm -hmm. because that's also what like really is the foundation of the story this is i i just really think this is a masterpiece of a book like it, yeah it just is like it's so great no oh anyhow absolutely i think that leads us well into our final book rating and i think we're gonna really surprise our viewers here oh my god is it a 10 it's, I mean, it's an 11, uh, it's, it's a 13, <laughs> it's a 27. I, uh, this book, this book is in my top three favorite books and, you know, my top three favorite books probably has 10 books that kind of rotate through the top three all the yeah. time, but 
Devil in Winter, there's nothing I would change. It always makes me happy to read. And no. I am in awe every time I read Lisa Kleypas's words on the page. I, I would agree 100%. Like, I am not known for my rereading, but this is one of those ones that when it was time to reread, I was like, oh, well, I already know I'm going to love it. And then I just fell in love with it all over again. It's so wonderful. Oh my goodness. Well, I hope that we did this book some justice. And if we didn't, I guess we'll just have to do it again next year. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, have an, uh, our yearly reread of uh, Devil in Winter. I do that already. <laughs> um, but yeah. But anyhow, um, this was so fun. This was a nice, a nice uh, read for us, for me, certainly. No, this is a good read for me as well. Well, but what are we reading next time? <gasps> next time, we're inching ever closer to the end of our journey that we began. I don't even know how long ago. And we over will be, a year ago. Over a year ago, for sure. And we will be reading It Started with a Scandal, which is Penny Royal number 10. Yes, Julianne Long, here we come. Uh, this is an interesting side quest, shall I call it? Uh, because this is not a Redmond or an Eversea at all. Um, oh, it's not. Which, yeah, this is one of, similarly to the um, the one with the Marquess mm -hmm. and, uh, oh, what was her name? I only remember her cat's name was Chartabris. <laughs> um, escaped me for now. But an earlier book in the series uh, where there were there were Penny Royal people uh, and Redmonds and Eversees, but it wasn't the main two characters. Um, so this is La Fay. LaVey. LaVey is the name that sent Violet on her um, ocean adventure. <laughs> Yes. And so Le it's LaVey's story. And I'm excited to read it because I I hated this book when it came out because I was reading it in real time. Like she was, this was a new book, a new release. And I oh, hated yeah. it because it wasn't Lion and Olivia's I know, book. And was I was like, like, are you kidding me? <laughs> no, but it sets up all the events for the next one. So that's so, why I'm so excited to read it now. Yeah. Now that we're not just dying for Olivia and Lion's book, we can actually read it and appreciate it for what it is. Yes, because, yeah, so I, I I remember a little bit about it, and I'm excited to read it. So that will be next time. So that'll be two weeks from today, because uh, that's the pace that we are operating at. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Nowadays. Life happens. Absolutely. So we would love it if you enjoyed what you heard today. Please rate, review, subscribe. That's how we get found. Click that like button if you're watching us on YouTube. And just thanks again, everyone, so much for listening. And join us next time as we read It Started With a Scandal by Julianne Long. And may all your ever afters end happily. Tea and Strumpets is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Did you know that 82 million households tuned into at least one episode of Bridgerton on Netflix the first month it was available? And did you know that Bridgerton is based on a romance novel series by Julia Quinn? Lots of people who have never picked up a romance novel before are dipping in as a result of the Netflix adaptation. If you are one of those people who don't identify as a romance reader, but decided to read one or more of the Bridgerton novels as a result of watching the show, I am asking for your help. That's right, you. But who am I? My name is Andrea Martucci, and I'm currently working on a research project to discover how Bridgerton fans are engaging with romance novels and how they perceive the romance fiction genre. I am the host of a podcast devoted to unpacking romance novels called Shelf Love Podcast. And the reason that I'm interested in Bridgerton fans specifically is because this is a once in a decade opportunity where a romance text is part of a larger cultural conversation which means that lots of new people all at once are giving romance a try. What I want to understand is how people get into romance or don't and how new readers perceive genre conventions. So here's how you can take part in this research project. I have a survey that probably just takes about five minutes to fill out. 
You can find the survey and learn more about the research project by going to bit.ly slash Bridgerton Research. That's bit.ly slash Bridgerton Research. You can also find more information on my website, shelflovepodcast.com. That's bit.ly slash Bridgerton Research or shelflovepodcast.com. I'm going to be presenting this research at the Popular Culture Association Conference in June 2021, as well as discussing it on Shelf Love Podcast later this year. Thank you so much for helping with this project. I really appreciate you. That link one more time is bit.ly slash Bridgerton Research. <laughs>